antarctica can i start sir yeah please go ahead yes. waiting you can switch oh, so on so i'll be video and show your face also at this point So I'll be covering ENT emergencies in pediatric patients under the three heading. First is bleeding tonsil, second is the aspirated foreign body removal, and third is the epiglottitis. So, first, uh, can the, you switch on your video, please? Yes. Sir. Thank you. Uh, yeah, go ahead. You can see. Yes. So, uh, first, uh, first condition is the bleeding tonsil. Uh, tonsillectomy is one of the most frequently performed surgical procedures in children, and the most serious complication of tonsillectomy is post-operative hemorrhage with an incidence of 0.1 percent to 8.1 percent, depending upon the surgical technique. The recent utilization of the coablation tonsillectomy may result in an incidence of post-tonsillectomy bleeding up to 11.1 percent. post tonsillar bleeding is classified as primary or secondary bleeding primary bleeding occurs within 24 hours after surgery it usually results from the significant emesis retching or straining secondary to swallowed blood or pain in addition to the inadequate surgical technique approximately 75% of the post tonsillar hemorrhage occurs within 6 hours of the surgery it is therefore desirable to observe the patient for 8 to 10 hours after the surgery in the day care set surgery setting secondary bleeding usually occurs 24 hours to 5 to 10 days after surgery and may be associated with slugging of the ischial loosened vessel ties or infection from the underlying chronic tonsillitis initial attempts to control bleeding may be made using gargling with ice water uh, and pharyngeal packing if this fails and bleeding persists or is severe then patient must return to the operating room in an emergency for exploration and surgical hemostasis so pre op assessment a thorough history and review of the anesthetic record of the original sur uh, surgery will provide per uh, pertinent information about the pre existing medical conditions especially bleeding diastasis use of medications such as aspirin difficulty with airway management and a rough estimate of intra operative blood loss and fluid replacement as well as duration of the known bleeding and the volume of the blood vomited since the last bleeding begin assessment of the child's volume status must be carried out the patient may be tachycardic with elevated blood pressure due to the release of the endogenous catecholamines from hemorrhage hypovolemia or fear or excitement uh, tachycardia weak or thready pulse tachypnea delayed capillary refill decreased urine output cold extremities with mottling or cyanosis and altered sensorium are early indicators of hypovolemia in children pallor poor skin turgor listless child and hypotension are indicators of advanced volume depletion increased swallowing coffee ground emesis and airway obstruction are some indirect indicators of the bleeding so we must assess the uh, volume of the child's volume first assessment of the child volume status should be done first then investigations uh, baseline hemoglobin hematocrit platelet count bleeding time and clotting time must be checked if any abnormality is detected in the baseline investigations then hematology consult and additional coagulation testing should be obtained blood grouping and cross matching should be obtained prior to the surgery then anesthetic management includes the two parts two parts first is resuscitation and second is the what is the procedure in the operating room so first we have to do the resuscitation of the child post tonsillectomy bleeding is almost always venous or capillary rather than the arterial although it may be quite brisk resuscitation rather than the immediate operation must be the first step in dealing with it the child with the bleeding tonsil is hypovolemic and he has a decrease in in cardiac output secondary to the ongoing blood loss if blood loss is severe or fluid resuscitation is not vigorous lactic acidosis and an eventual state of shock will develop the compensatory response to acute blood loss is release of the catecholamines this causes peripheral vasoconstriction which delays the clinical onset of the hypotension in the awake child when anesthesia induced vasodilation occurs profound hypotension is observed 
significant cardiovascular collapse can occur if a general anesthetic is induced in the severely hypovolemic patient. Hence, assessment of the volume status and aggressive fluid resuscitation should be carried out before taking the patient to the operating room. It is often difficult to measure the exact blood loss as it occurs often several hours and is par partly swallowed. The child must be kept in the lateral position with head low to prevent aspiration. Oxygen must be given via Hudson mask. Two large bore intravenous lines must be established for rapid hydration. Vigorous fluid resuscitation with crystalloids in repeated boluses of 20 ml per kg of balanced salt solution or colloids is the key to improve the cardiac output and achieve hemodynamic stability before induction of anesthesia. More blood and blood products should be available for surgery. Once vital signs have improved and are stable, then the child is taken to the operating room. The degree of tachycardia being a useful sign of the efficacy of the fluid replacement. Restlessness is often due to the hypovolemia, hence preoperative sedation must be avoided in such cases. Then the procedure in the operating room. The patient is brought into the operating room and monitors are placed before induction of the anesthesia. Before the induction of anesthesia, all the precautions and preparations for the patient with a full stomach and difficult laryngoscopy and intubation should be made, including well-functioning suction apparatus with large bore suction tubes. A selection of the smaller tracheal tubes may be needed if airway and tracheal edema is significant. Equipment for an immediate tracheostomy should be readily available. Pre-oxygenation can be done with the patient in the lateral head down position to encourage blood to drain out of the mouth. The child is then turned supine. Options for induction of anesthesia include a rapid sequence induction with required pressure or an inhaled induction. Rapid sequence induction. The advantage of the rapid sequence induction with required pressure is rapid induction and control of the airway with less chance of regurgitation during the induction. The choice of induction drug should be based on the patient's volume status and hemodynamic stability. The neuromuscular blockers that give the best intubating condition is uh, less than 60 to 90 seconds would be succinylcholine 2 mg per kg or rocuronium 1.2 mg per kg. Reintubation may be difficult if bleeding is obscuring the view or due to the edema from previous airway instrumentation and surgery. Both sides of the chest are carefully auscultated and the endotracheal tube is suctioned to rule out aspiration of the blood or gastric contents. Throat should be well packed to prevent aspiration of the blood. After intubation, a large bore gastric tube should be placed to decompress the stomach at the beginning and at the end of the procedure. The second method is inhaled induction. If a patient has respiratory distress before the induction of anesthesia, Using inhalational anesthesia and a FiO2 of uh, 100% will allow the anesthesiologist to determine if positive pressure ventilation can be administered before giving muscle relaxant. The advantage of this technique is that spontaneous respiration is maintained and is helpful in patients with anticipated difficult intubation. However, this technique can be slow and blood can be inhaled precipitating laryngospasm. Control ventilation provides good conditions for hemostasis. Continuation of the resuscitation and maintenance of anesthesia should be tailored according to the hemodynamics and the patient response to induction. Adequate depth should be maintained to prevent any reflex-induced tachycardia, hypertension, arrhythmia, coughing and retching on the tube. At the end of the surgery, the gastric tube is suctioned, but this does not guarantee an empty stomach as blood clots may still remain in the stomach. This along with the pharyngeal mucosal irritation uh, predisposes to post-operative vomiting. Hence, the use of prophylactic antiemetic therapy in the form of an ondansetron 0.1 mg per kg uh, can be used. Topical lidocaine 4 mg per kg in concentration of 2 to 4 percent can be used to reduce the incidence of post-extubation laryngospasm and is as effective as 1 mg intravenous lidocaine without the sedative effects. Then, at the extubation, after the procedure, the anesthesiologist should again auscultate both sides of the chest to rule out the presence of aspirated blood or secretions. One should remember to verify removal of the throat pack before extubation. The pharynx must be suctioned under direct vision. 
with a traumatic suction catheter to prevent bleeding caused by agitation of raw mucosal surfaces by a suction catheter the patient is then turned on to the side in the tonsillar position after the neuromuscular block is antagonized patients are extubated awake when protective reflexes have returned stormy emergence predisposes patients to rebleeding from the surgical side the patient is then shifted to the high quality recovery room in the tonsillar position this position allows the pooling of the blood and secretions to occur on the side of the mouth rather than the midline thus decreasing the chances of pharyngospasm also the upper airway of the child widens in the lateral position and is less likely to obstruct so to summarize the anesthetic considerations in bleeding tonsil we have to take care of the hypovolemia adequate fluid resuscitation uh, is essential before induction care should be exercised when using anesthetic agents that may cause vasodilation and hypotension second uh, point we have to consider that is pulmonary aspiration these patients must be considered to have a full stomach due to the swallowed blood and therefore they are at increased risk of pulmonary aspiration then third is the potential for difficult laryngoscopy and intubation laryngoscopy is likely to be difficult due to the presence of the blood clots in the pharynx bleeding tonsillar bed and reduced venous and lymphatic drainage causing intraoral swelling and edema earlier airway instrumentation may lead to vocal cord edema with or without subglottic edema uh, if so a smaller tracheal tube should be considered the effects of the previous general anesthetic and perioperative opioids should be considered and if there is any abnormal uh, clotting uh, we should ask the history whether ansets have been uh, given uh, or not uh, and we should avoid the ansets airway obstruction uh, as there is a presence of blood in the airway or large clot in the oral cavity it may uh, cause airway obstruction so these are the points we have to consider uh, during uh, bleeding tonsil okay now we will first finish the discussion on this to some extent before you go to the next half of the question next uh, remaining part of the question yes sir are you beautifully are you a primary or a secondary student so the secondary student okay very good then the very beautifully prepared answer for a secondary student and uh, you said that it is a case of full stomach yes sir. why why it is considered as a case of full stomach so because uh, the tonsil uh, we don't know exactly uh, since how many time the bleeding is occurring and the child may have aspirated the blood and there may be blood blood clots in the stomach aspirated or swallowed swallowing swallowing yeah, yeah. Uh, so it is uh, we cannot judge the bleeding by looking at the cd tray or something but uh, they mostly they swallow whatever it is only they can swallow they swallow any other reason for the full stomach Other than following the blood, so the um, NBMRs may uh, may have uh, completed. Then child may have asked to eat, to eat or ah. to drink. Oh, the yeah. could have been resumed. Okay, nowadays yeah. they uh, try to reinstate enteral feeding as early as possible. Yeah. So, what are the common feeds that are given after a tonsillectomy? Ice cream. Ice cream, sir. Particularly, we ask all cold things, you know, cold things, ice yeah. cold milk or ice cream, roast milk, all those things. Yes, sir. So they all come under what category? How long you have to wait if you are going to take milk as a intake? Normally, in a child, solid food we say six hours, milk and other things four hours, isn't it? So yes, the sir. two reasons why they become like full stomach patients are one is they can swallow. the blood and that can cause accumulate there second reason is they could have started supposing the bleeding is detected after 6 hours or 7 hours and by the time child had had two or three scoops of ice cream and one or two cups of uh, roast milk also yes that sir. also contributes to the now you said you will put a gastric tube after intubation and try to empty the stomach should it be done before you induce the patient or after induction of the patient sir already the airway can be difficult due to the uh, continuous uh, bleeding in the mouth so yes. it may be difficult so we should uh, secure the airway first 
so it may be difficult to aspirate the stomach because of the bleeding in the oral cavity ongoing bleeding yeah in clots in the throat so that is the reason why we want to aspirate is there any newer tool which is available to find out how much is the quantity of uh, gastric content sir we can do uh, sonography ah yes yes and uh, see uh, the uh, see the uh, gastric uh, content whether it is empty or there is a fluid or solid mm. So nowadays, with the advent of ultrasonography being frequently used in the preoperative evaluation of the patient, both for airway as well as for the gastric content, you can use the USG. It is not given in the older textbooks. Now newer thing, you can use that to find out what is the gastric content of the patient. And if it is more than 30 ml, it is a very high chance that aspiration can happen. In that case, you can try to put in a gastric tube even earlier and try to get and see that and before you start inducing the anesthesia yes sir and yes, what sir. about blood you should you bring blood to the ot or not yes sir what are indications for that sir if uh, hematocrit is uh, less than uh, 30% percent, hmm. then uh, blood should so be transfused clinical conditions you know yeah. the first thing what you do is when you are called to assess a patient for uh, re exploration of uh, bleeding tonsil what will you do as an anesthesiologist when you go to the post op ward to see a patient who is crying who is drooling over blood and uh, saliva from the mouth restless but how do you first assess the uh, hemodynamic stability of the patient sir i'll see the pulse uh, oh. the child must be tachycardic oh. and uh, i'll see for the blood pressure Hmm. then pallor of the uh, pallor of the skin hmm. and uh, also the uh, clinical status of the child whether the child is alert crying or whether the child is refill time Does yes a be... capillary refill time uh, it will if the capillary refill time is uh, slow then it can uh, suggest the hypotension hypovolemia hmm. not hypotension actually hypovolemia So, if supposing you find the capillary refill time is four seconds, pulse rate is 150, BP is 80 by 50, child conjunctiva looks very pale. What will you do? Will you order the blood to be brought to the theater, or you will just uh, ask them to keep it reserved and then wait for the surgery to get over? Sir, I'll uh, secure. Uh, white bore uh, IV uh, cannula and resuscitate the child at the same time hmm. before so taking the child. Will you order the blood to be brought or not? That is the question. Yes, sir. Hmm. So it's always safer to keep the blood in the OT. Okay? Yes. Sir. We want only CRCs or we want a fresh blood, whole blood. Sir, whole blood. Why? So clotting factors uh, may be deficient. Whole blood, that is fresh whole blood, is good enough. But if it is a stored blood, is good enough? Nowadays they say it is uh, preferable to give the individual components instead of giving the whole blood. Okay, so prefer. I'm asking all these things because this question can come in the theory paper as a, a short short question, as well as it can come in your clinical view also when you discuss about the anesthesia part also. Well, I did not explain the answer. Okay, that is the reason I am just asking you to find out your knowledge about who you manage. If you once in a rare while you can develop, you can encounter a problem like this in your practice. So it is better to know what you have to do beforehand, so that you will be well prepared to face the situation. Okay? Yes. What are all the previous notes that we will go to when you go and see the baby in the post-operative ward? What are all the pre-op, I mean post-op, pre-op, intra-op notes that you will go through? Which are all the important points you will look for? So whether the uh... I will ask uh, information regarding the airway and intubation whether it was difficult or not, and uh, how much blood loss was during the surgery what and how much. What are the ways of intubating this child for a transplant? What are the? 
what are all the ways do you put a oral tube or a nasal tube uh, sir uh, we can uh, we can do both nasal and oral at the same time or depending upon particular size the tube so preferably uh, preferably uh, in the children uh, we do oral but in adults uh, we can do nasal preferably won't you discuss with the surgeon is there any bearing on what type of surgery is going to be performed and whether what route is preferable yeah we'll which discuss surgery with the you surgeon. would like to put an oral tube or which surgery you would you like to put a nasal tube sir we put nasal tube uh, because of, for the uh, lower uh, oral surgeries or mandibular surgeries no no this now discussion is about tonsillectomy only i am not okay. asking along with tonsil along with tonsil they always do something else is there for some patients sir so, if we are do? doing adenoic uh, adenoid ah. surgeries uh, then uh, we have to put the oral tube we have to consult ah. with the surgeon ah. yes so oral tube which type of tube you prefer to put nowadays Sir, uh, preferably be south uh, pole tube. Ah, oral ray tube, cuff to oral ray tube. Yes. Right? Whereas nasal is done for pure tonsillectomy alone. No adenoidectomy. Go grown up child. They want to do only removal of the tonsils. Then you can put a nasal tube. Yes. So that uh, route of intubation is very important. Whether so earlier it was too. What is the uh, significance of that? Supposing they have done both. uh the adenoidectomy and tonsillectomy and now they want to explore and the surgeon says i want a good view you put a nasal tube he is telling you like that can you do that child has no sir because tonsillectomy and adenoidectomy five hours earlier there is a bleeding surgeon says you put a nasal tube so that i will have a comfortable vision it is advisable to put a nasal tube because he is testing for that no sir uh, that time uh, if we put a nasal tube that can uh, injure the raw area of, of the adenoidectomy area and can cause bleeding yes you know, so you have to explain to the surgeon that there is a possibility of bleeding from there also so i can't put a nasal tube here okay so that is yes. the big significance of the information about the earlier route of intubation and as yes. you rightly said you should always have a uh, smaller size tube available because of the edema you may not pass the same uh, 5.5 or 6 size tube that was passed earlier you have to keep one size lower also ready so that you can manage it okay so these yes. are all the points that you have right to mention and you have to keep right go ahead and uh, present the next part Uh, sir, sir, one minute, sir. Sir, sir, sir. Ah. she said something about throat pack. I, I've never heard of throat pack for tonsillic for post tonsillectomy bleeding, sir. Maybe on one side they will keep it. They look on the side and then do it. Yeah, it is throat pack. It should be done by the surgeon. But here we don't do that. We just uh, uh, surgeon himself will carry it. Because when you put a cuff tube, there is no need for a throat pack here. So, throat pack. Sir, in our institute, surgeon demand of the throat pack, so we put throat pack in okay. tonsillectomy patients. You are trained like that. Yes. But uh, here we don't normally do a throat pack for just an exploration and ligation. And again, between uh, the technique of uh, maintenance, whether to leave the baby a child or <laughs> for tedious, or go for control ventilation. depends upon the surgeon skill and uh, duration of the surgery is going to perform the majority of them are easily going to find out the bleeder and try to catch it and uh, close it so you know, i i have been working with ent surgeons for long time and we have done more than 2000 uh, tonsil or like that and uh, i would have I come across only uh, two or three post tonsillectomy bleeds in my career and uh, all of them even during the tonsillectomy itself is uh, done as a, a with spontaneous breathing technique we, we never used to paralyze and control the ventilation because the surgeon is so fast the surgery gets over within 15 minutes time both sides and uh, they want a good recovery of the baby with uh, complete uh, 
gag reflex and cough reflex intact. So uh, we used to leave them on spontaneous, and once we cut the the specific agents, the newest agent, they recover fully, and we extubate them in the lab position. But nowadays, because of the availability of atracurium, we are all tempted to intubate them with atracurium, and we need to control and maintain uh, the paralyzed uh, child to ventilate. So the there is a, again the pros and cons of whether to go for spontaneous ventilation or control ventilation for uh, controlling a bleeding tonsil. So this is being not a very extensive procedure majority of the time. <clears throat> if you use uh, scolene for rapid sequence induction, you can easily maintain on spontaneous once the reflexes come back or the breathing starts. And the finish of the surgery in spontaneous itself without the need for giving a long acting muscle relaxation and waiting and reversing and all that. And uh, the uh, only uh, again the controversy that used to be there is can you administer scolene for a, a baby who had a control ventilation earlier with a non depolarizing muscle relaxation which has been reversed with years to be? Can you use such a method? If it is within two hours, they say it is not ideal to use succinetolium, but uh, if it is more than two hours with the gap between the earlier procedure and the current exploration, then you can safely use succinetolium. Uh, that is the current accepted concept for usage of the rapid sequence injection because of which come up and the use of succinetolium in these cases. Okay. okay. Yes. So also, so also there was one some mention about aspirin somewhere at the beginning. I don't know whether I heard it wrong or I don't know what it is. Somewhere she mentioned aspirin. Is did you not, Roshni? Yes, ma'am. The beginning, yeah. It doesn't make any um, uh, impact on this because it's a child with a post tonsillectomy bleeding. I don't think it's necessary at all. That's something. And also the induction induction with inhalation agent. I really don't know. Whether it is advisable to do a inhalation induction in a post tonsillectomy bleeding when the reflexes are not, I mean, like a, it goes away and then you can, as chance of aspiration will be much, much higher. Again, another sir, question they sir. can ask you ah. is mm. uh, supposing the bleeding is so severe and you are halfway through the resuscitation and surgeon hurries you saying that don't wait, we are going to only use more blood. Then what will be the best method of induction? Supposing from 80, 50, you have brought the blood pressure only to 160. And pulse rate has come down from 150 to 130. Still the child is looking little pale, and uh, but the bleeding is so heavy that you, the surgeon is uh, urging you to bring the baby to the OT and start the exploration so that you can control the bleeding at the earliest. In that situation, what, how will you manage it? Really? What will be the best induction age? Partially resuscitated child. So, ketamine or ketamine? Ketofol is the best agent. You can use a combination of ketamine and propofol, which is now available. So, 50% okay. of both will be a better induction agent with the analgesia. So, Another important point is uh, sometimes, you know, even after post op, they would have administered some opioid also if the child has been crying and uh, complaining of pain. Uh, some routinely give paracetamol. Sometimes, it, in spite of paracetamol, fentanyl, yes, fentanyl. Uh, given some fentanyl or pentacosine or some other uh, opioid drug. That uh, history is also very important because for exploration, you don't require that great an analgesia like a regular tonsillectomy uh, or a renal procedure. So it is just a well open mouth and uh, looking at the pulsa and then trying to catch the bleeder and uh, tie it. So uh, procedure wise, it is not a very painful procedure. So try to underplay your analgesic agents. Use as much as possible non opioid agents for. Mm -hmm. Uh, analgesia intraoperatively for exploration of a bleeding tonsil. That is another practical point that we have to remember. Okay. Okay. Sir. Okay. Yeah. Anandi, is it okay? Shall we go ahead with the next part? Yes, 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 sir. 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 Yes, sir.
So second topic is aspirated foreign body removal. Aspiration of the foreign body accounts for an important cause of morbidity and mortality in children between one to three years of the age. It is potentially a life-threatening event and may also cause chronic lung injury if not properly managed. The diagnosis and treatment of the problem requires awareness and highest degree of suspicion of signs and symptoms of foreign body aspiration in the absence of a history of trauma or infection, the onset of the respiratory distress in a toddler which has no underlying airway abnormality should raise the suspicion of an acute aspiration of a foreign body. Food particles comprise, uh, comprise the major, uh, majority of the aspirated items. However, beads, pins or small toys are not unusual. Each type of aspirated item has potential complications associated with it. For example, vegetable items expand with moisture encountered in the respiratory tract and can fragment into multiple pieces, thus creating a situation in which the original foreign body is in one bronchus and with the coughing, a fragment is dislodged and transported to the other bronchus. And second is the oil containing objects such as peanuts uh, can cause a chemical inflammation uh, and sharp objects can cause bleeding in addition to the obstruction. In adults, the foreign body aspiration occurs more commonly in the right main, uh, right main bronchus than the left. However, in the pediatric age group, the aspirated foreign bodies lodge frequently in the proximal airways due to the smaller bronchial tree diagram and both right and left bronchi are equally susceptible for foreign body aspiration. The gold standard for diagnosis and management of the foreign body aspiration is rigid open tube bronchoscopy under general anesthesia. Now the goals of anesthesia for uh, bronchoscopy. Uh, first, we have to uh, consider uh, to maintain the adequate ventilation and oxygenation while maintaining a clear view and appropriate assess for the bronchoscopist. Uh, secondly, uh, we should maintain an adequate depth of anesthesia, amnesia, analgesia and sufficient muscle relaxation to allow easy passage of the instrument without abolition of the cardiorespiratory reflexes. Third, we have to prevent the pulmonary aspiration. Fourth, we have to uh, we have to make quick return of the consciousness, respiratory drive, and upper airway reflexes at the end of the procedure. And uh, fifth point is uh, we have to allow longer time duration for the procedure. And there is a minimize. We should uh, have minimization of the secretions of the patient. Then in preoperative evaluation. An assessment must be made of the location, suspected type and degree to which the foreign body is obstructing the airway because these factors influence the approach for removal and thus the anesthetic technique. Distal foreign bodies are more difficult to remove whereas proximal ones are more likely to obstruct the airway. Signs of airway obstruction include obvious distress, strider, tachypnea, nasal flaring and chest retraction. Presenting symptom of an inhaled foreign body depends on the time since aspiration. The child with a foreign body in the airway usually presents with a history of choking episode, the aptly named penetration syndrome. If the child is unable to give history or if the episode is not witnessed, it may not be identified. Also, the initial symptoms of inhaled foreign body like coughing, wheezing or raspy breathing may be missed in these cases. One must look for signs of airway obstruction, quantify the respiratory distress, note the respiratory rate, characteristic of breathing, presence or absence of cyanosis, anxiety, and finally evaluate the child's sensorium. The severity of the respiratory embarrassment following aspiration of a foreign body depends on its location and the nature. A foreign body with the sharp edges can tear the mucosa resulting in pneumothorax, pneumomediastinium or subcutaneous emphysema. Also sharp objects cause bleeding into the airway in addition to the obstruction. Encapsulated dry vegetables such as beans can swell in the presence of moisture and cause respiratory embarrassment in a previously asymptomatic child. If possible, attempts should be made to determine whether the foreign body is in the larynx trachea or bronchus. Laryngeal foreign bodies are always symptomatic and are more likely to cause airway obstruction. Patients with foreign body within the larynx and trachea present with acute dyspnea, strider, coughing, cyanosis and wheezing is heard more often with subglottic obstruction. 
a normal voice with a brassy cuff and bidirectional stridor occur with a tracheal foreign body expiratory wheezing pneumonia atelectasis chest pain or cuff suggest a distal location in this cases physical finding may include asymmetric breath sounds with decreased breath sounds in the post obstructive uh, obstructive areas and adventitious sounds like ronchi or crepitations foreign bodies located in the bronchi may dislodge from cuff or change in the position and cause total airway obstruction therefore prompt removal is important fever and symptoms and signs of a chest infection are typical presenting symptoms in those who are first seen more than 24 hours after respiration in the presence of long standing aspirated foreign bodies the possible complications include pneumonitis atelectasis emphysema massive hemoptysis lung abscess and bronchiectasis all patients suspected of a foreign body in the airway should have post operative and lateral chest films and a lateral soft tissue neck radiograph then inside uh, under the resuscitation complete airway obstruction is rarely seen by the tertiary care team in such a scenario primary intervention by a hemlich maneuver is the therapy of first choice followed by the digital extraction extraction one should be aware that the digital manipulation can push an obstructing foreign body further into the airway if the patient has become hypoxic cyanotic and moribund the only life saving option is tracheostomy partial airway obstruction is the clinical entity most frequently encountered the guiding principle of treatment should be do not convert a partial airway obstruction into a complete airway obstruction the surgeon must be prepared to perform an emergency tracheostomy or cricothyrotomy if partial obstruction suddenly becomes complete all aspirated foreign bodies in the airway should be removed in the operation room and considered to be emergency situations no sedation is to be administered to the patients before removal of the foreign body anesthesia for laryngotracheal foreign bodies inhalational induction and maintenance of spontaneous breathing is preferred to prevent displacement of the foreign body and further obstruction of the airway for bronchial foreign bodies both the induction of anesthesia be either inhalational or intravenous agents are acceptable inhalational induction can be prolonged secondary to the obstruction of the airway and nitrous oxide should be avoided to prevent air trapping distal to the obstruction after evacuation of the stomach by orogastric tube the air wish may be given over to the surgeon who introduces a rigid bronchoscope and removes the aspirated object spontaneous ventilation should be preserved until the location and nature of the foreign body have been determined a rigid bronchoscope can be used for ventilation of the lungs during the examination of the airway ventilation via the bronchoscope is accomplished via side port which can be attached to the anesthesia circuit during ventilation with the weaving telescope in place high resistance may be encountered as a result of the partial occlusion of the lumen high fresh high fresh gas flow rate uh, large tidal volume and high inspired volatile anesthetic concentrations are often necessary to compensate for leaks around the ventilating bronchoscope and the high resistance encountered when the weaving telescope is in the place an alternative method of ventilation is the jet ventilation technique which involves intermittent burst of oxygen delivered under high pressure uh, under pressure through a 16 gauge catheter attached to a ra rapid bronchoscope then bronchospasm may occur during examination of the respiratory tract and should be treated with increasing depth of anesthesia nebulized albuterol or intravenous bronchodilators once the foreign body has been removed examination of the tracheobronchial tree is carried out to detect any additional objects or fragments often vigorous irrigation and suctioning distal to the obstruction are required to remove the secretions and prevent the possibility of post operative pneumonia steroids are administered if inflammation of the airway mucosa is observed close post operative observation of the patient is required so that early intervention may be instituted in the event of respiratory compromise secondary to the airway edema or infection that's all about foreign body films am i audible now yes sir okay.
what is the role of uh, total intravenous anesthesia for foreign body removal when will you advocate that so preferably when the foreign body is in the bronchus hmm. you said for commonly yes. foreign body is in the bronchus if it is in the trachea or uh... sir uh, preferably uh, inhalational is uh, preferred and uh, over that is spontaneous ventilation is preferred <laughs> no, in Shiva, you you spontaneous ventilation, no? Hmm. You are not going to interfere with the ventilation. You are not using any muscle relaxant. You are using only intravenous agents to keep the patient unconscious and immobile. In the advent of propofol, dexmedetomidine, and ketamine, nowadays they prefer to use that also for maintenance of anesthesia in the spontaneously breathing patient. Okay? So that is one of the new things that you have to remember. And always it's better to <clears throat> start saying that when the patient comes to the hospital, if it is going to be an acute obstruction at the laryngeal level or the tracheal level, invariably the patient will immediately die of hypoxia. They never reach the hospital. Okay? Yes. But if they happen to come to the hospital, uh, if it is a distal obstruction, which means by means what I say is it is the bronchus and beyond the bronchus, lobar lagnal, then it is not an acute life threatening emergency. Patient will have some cough, some uh, disturbance, some tachypnea may be there, but it, uh, they will never be desaturated or they will not be acutely hypoxic. Whereas if it is an upper airway obstruction, like a battery uh, impacted uh, a small battery or a coin in the laryngeal or a tracheal level, that causes a strider, difficulty in breathing, drooling, and all those things. Okay? So those yeah. patients only require an emergent uh, intervention to remove that so that they can be made comfortable. In that... <laughs> <laughs> So in that location, the upper airway of foreign bodies, it is preferable to <clears throat> maintain spontaneous ventilation so that you can easily pick up the foreign body quickly and come out. Whereas if it is a known distal location, you can safely go for control ventilation even from the beginning. There is no hard and fast rule, but it should also be maintained only on the spontaneous mode only. Then some institutions they use fiber optic also. What are the advantages and disadvantages of using a fiber optic bronchoscope over a rigid bronchoscope for foreign body removal? Sir, it can offer uh, not that much resistance as compared to uh, rigid hmm. bronchoscope. Hmm. Flexible bronchoscope are uh, more easy to manipulate and go into smaller airways also. That is the base and big, biggest advantage because rigid bronchoscope can go only up to a particular level. I guess. But what are the disadvantages? Why it is not so popular like a rigid bronchoscope, open tube bronchoscope? You said the gold standard is to use the open tube rigid bronchoscope. Why and you said ventilation, no? And you said something about ventilation. We can do uh, ventilation. Is there a ventilatory port in a flexible bronchoscope that is not available. So, supposing so you are going to a new institution after your qualification, and uh, that institution has been using only flexible bronchoscope for foreign body retrieval, and surgeon says, I want to use this. How will you ventilate the time? Mm, sir, we can use a uh, jet ventilation jet ventilation jet is only with the rigid bronchoscope rigid it's like the, the fob you can't do that you have to ventilate you have to definitely oxygenate but how um we can hold the and uh sir and patient end of the circuit uh, towards the mouth <laughs> You have to use an LMA and ask him to pass it through that. <coughs> then you can ventilate through that. Okay. Okay. There are other things called the tubeless technique. Uh, tubeless technique where you don't put a tube at all. 
um, you put just a, a airway exchange catheter and keep giving oxygen in the side of the trachea because it's so small and then allow the surgeon to manipulate whatever he wants within the larynx and the bronchus and all that. So there's enough space for them to do that. Apneic ventilation technique Apneic and ventilation. Uh, this. Yeah. That's what has come into the thing, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. There is and thrive, adapter thrive also, can be done, there is not a, the foreign body. Yeah. There is a Cook's adapter, which has a three piece like uh, setup, wherein we can go the bronchial blocker also to place it with a hydroptic panel. So that way, the yes. third side can be used for continuous ventilation. That, that adapter is uh, not available universally in all the places, but if such an area, if you are if you can make it available, that will be very handy. Right. Can you complete the last portion of the question? Yes, sir. Yes. What is the importance of that particular uh, last segment of that question? Epiglottitis. How common it is, and what is the role of anesthesiologist in the management of an epiglottitis? Yes, sir. Acute epiglottitis is uh, one of the most feared infectious diseases in children and adults and is the result of Haemophilus influenza type B. Since 1985, with the widespread vaccination against uh, Haemophilus influenza type B, which was the most common organism related to the epiglottitis, the overall incidence among the children has dropped dramatically. It can progress with extreme rapidity for, uh, from sore throat to airway obstruction to respiratory failure and ultimately to death if proper diagnosis and intervention are not rapidly implemented. Patients are usually between the two to seven years of the age. Vaccination against Haemophilus influenza type B polysaccharide is now recommended before two years of the age to provide immunity against the greatest period of vulnerability in the pediatric patients. Characteristic signs and symptoms of acute epiglottitis include the sudden onset of fever, dysphagia, drooling, thick muffled voice and preference for the sitting position with the head extended and leaning forward. Retraction, labored breathing and cyanosis may be observed in cases in which respiratory obstruction is present. However, in the early stages, the patient may be pale and toxic without respiratory distress. Supraglottitis may be a more appropriate designation uh, for it because it is a tissue two of the supraglottic structures from the vellicular to the arytenoids that are involved in the infectious process. Every attempt should be made to keep the patient calm, blood drawing, intravenous catheter insertion, excessive manipulation of the patient as well as sedation should be avoided before securing the airway to avoid the possibility of total obstruction. If the clinical situation allows, oxygen should be administered by mask and lateral radiographs of the soft tissue should be obtained. Thickening of the array epiglottic fold and swelling of the epiglottitis may be noted in it. The patient with severe airway compromise should proceed directly to the operating room accompanied by both anesthesiologist and surgeon. Parental presence in this situation may calm an anxious or frightened child. In all the cases of epiglottitis, an artificial airway is established by means of tracheal intubation. In the operating room, the child is kept in the sitting position while monitors are placed. A pulse oximeter and a precordial stethoscope are essential. The operating room must be prepared with equipment and personnel for laryngoscopy, rigid bronchoscopy and tracheostomy. Anesthetic induction is accomplished by inhalation of oxygen and increasing concentrations of the CO fluorine. After loss of consciousness occurs, IV assess should be secured and the child lowered into the supine position. Laryngoscopy followed by the tracheal intubation is accomplished without the use of muscle relaxants. The adnotracheal uh, tube chosen should be at least one side smaller than would normally be chosen and a stillet is often useful. Once the surgeon has examined the larynx, noting the appearance of epiglottitis, array epiglottic folds and surrounding tissues, the endotracheal tube may be changed to nasotracheal tube and secured. Tissue and blood culture are taken and antibiotic therapy is initiated. The child is then transferred to the ICU for continued observation and radiographic confirmation of the tube placement. Sedation is appropriate at this time. Tracheal extubation is usually attempted 48 to 72 hours later in the operating room when a significant leak around the nasotracheal tube is present 
as a vi- and a visual inspection of the larynx by flexible fiber optic bronchoscopy confirms the reduction in the swelling of the epiglottis and the surrounding tissues the other half is uh, slash croup also is given as a croup yes sir what is sir, the croup <laughs> or it is also called as the laryngotracheal bronchitis it uh, occurs in the children from 6 months to 6 years of the age and uh, but is primarily seen in children younger than 3 years of the age uh, it is usually viral in etiology and its onset is more insidious than that of the epiglottitis the child presents with a low grade fever inspiratory stridor and a barking cough radiographic examination confirms the diagnosis and subglottic narrowing of the airway column secondary to the circumferential soft tissue edema produces the stipal sign characteristic of the laryngotracheal bronchitis treatment includes cool humidified mist and oxygen therapy usually administered in a tent for mild to moderate cases severe cases of laryngotracheal bronchitis are accompanied by tachypnea tachycardia cyanosis and uh, in rare circumstances thick secretions are also present in the airway and the child requires intubation to allow pulmonary dilate and suctioning to be performed management in the icu and extubation are carried out in the same fashion as uh, of epiglottitis so this uh, last portion of the question is mainly to as an intensive care uh, treatment for an acute airway obstruction condition okay more than any surgical intervention it is mainly as a intensive uh, looking at the pediatric icu you may come across these uh, cases and supposing you try to uh, induce anesthesia why you are why do you have to induce anesthesia and do uh, laryngos- laryngoscopy and some uh, intubation why can't you do it in an awake child when you know there is a uh, epiglottitis uh, as diagnosed by your x-ray and other investigations with the clinical features of the child preferring to sit up drooling and all these things when you know there is an epiglottitis why can't you try to intubate it the child in the icu itself why do you want to ship the child to the ot keep everything ready for even a tracheostomy and try to do that sir uh, the differential pressures uh, in the awake child uh, it increases uh, in Partial during the obstruction will land up in a total obstruction into right? complete obstruction yes yeah. examine the throat in a child which is not properly prepared and sedated for securing the airway we may land up in a total obstruction and lose the child because children rapidly desaturate and become bradycardic and arrest faster so that is the reason why so much of precaution is given to take them to the ot try to induce anesthesia and reduce all the reflexes and keep every equipment ready and then try to do your intubation another common question because this question, this condition this uh, clinical picture is not commonly encountered one more practical question they may ask you is you put, to induce anesthesia you try to see the vocal cords nothing is seen everything is a red bulge there how would you know whether there is a glottic opening or not suppose you have somebody to help you how will you identify the glottic opening after you have put in your laryngoscope and you are not able to visualize anything but uh, cherry red like uh, blobs there any amount of external compression like burp and all these things they, nothing is revealed in that case what is the practical solution to find out where is the glottic opening can you ask somebody who is helping you to do something to find out the hole the laryngeal inlet <coughs> ask your assistant to press on the lower chest of the baby okay what will you get you will see air bubbles coming out through the glottic opening Yeah. that is the method they describe to identify the glottic opening so based on that you put put your buji or a airway exchanger and then try to thread your uh, tube through that okay okay sir so i'll just show uh, quickly a presentation on all these three as far as, as possible